Welcome to the fourth installment of the How It Works Power Webinar Series. I'm David Velasco and I'll be your host today. We will have a 20 minute session and we will have a couple uh, minutes afterwards for Q&A. So we often hear about the hurricane season, right? It starts from June to about November. However, the way things are going, it's more like disaster season that starts from January to December. Every time we turn on the news, we hear about a new natural catastrophe, natural disaster. Now, are you and is your community ready to face these catastrophes, these disasters? To help us get on the way, get ready, we will have today a newlywed uh, insurance broker, Mr. Steve Roderick. Hey, yes. Ah, nice ring, Steve. And your broker, that's your brokers at Fixed Things. We also have uh, the brokers that walked in your shoes before because he was a manager at some point. Ross Reitman, welcome to everyone to both of you. Thanks for joining us. And in just a minute, we will uh, introduce you to a climb extraordinaire. Today, we want to discuss what can we do before, during, and after a disaster occur. So let's start with what we can do before. And that's probably the biggest chunk. Steve, can you describe the kind of disasters that an association may face? Well, sure. Um, but the planning process should really take a, an all hazards approach. Uh, the probability that a specific hazard will impact your community is hard to determine. That's why it's important to consider many different threats and hazards uh, and the likelihood that they might occur. All right. Fine. But for today's discussion, why don't we just stick to like the, the natural disaster and not every single thing under the sun that humans can bring okay. upon themselves? Okay, sure, sure. So so hurricanes, floods, blizzards are some of the most common to this part of the country. But we also see uh, tornadoes and even wildfires. Uh, and don't forget, we haven't seen a bad earthquake for a long time, but it could happen. A 4.8 hit Trenton back in like 1938 and it could happen again and it could actually be much, much worse. Yeah, that's right, Steve. Anything could really happen. You know, we've seen a ton of evidence on the news. 2020 is damages totaled $95 billion in damage for the U.S. And that was nearly uh, double what we experienced in 2019. Did you say billions with a B? Billions with a B. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's some big numbers right there. Now, Ross, uh, in your opinion, as an insurance professional, what's the best time to talk about the disaster preparedness? So, David, just like all the plans we talked about, I feel like we should have started them yesterday when it comes down to it. But if you haven't, you know, now is the time we can get going today. The real key here is getting a plan completed prior to an event taking place. And our residents depend on our uh, board members and our management to create these disaster plans. And most likely the manager is going to be the one that completes it. But the board's got to give direction and info and also time for management to complete the disaster plan. That's true. It gives them time to do to do that task. But that task doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun at all. Nope, definitely not fun, not in the least. Uh, but when the plan's finished, I can assure you, you'll be patting yourself on the back saying job well done to your association. And then let's just hope you really don't have to put this plan to use when it comes down to it. Yeah. So that, that brings like a, a quick question on this. Uh, Steve, I'm going to turn that to you. Do you think it would be a good idea following up on, the, on Ross's comment for the board to have a a disaster commander. What do you think of that? Um, commander, it's a, it's a little bit military. It's, I'm not sure how you say it in French. Um. Well, in French, that would be like the, the coordinateur de plan d'urgence en cas de désastre. Mais uh, you can do whatever you want. So yeah, okay, what do you okay, think? Okay. Dis disaster <laughs> officer on the board, what, what do you want? Okay, okay. well, <laughs> to be honest, uh, the name isn't really as important as the job itself. Uh, and it's really up to the board and the community, but it is very important to designate someone who will take the lead and be the main point of contact during an emergency. Very true, very true. So how do you want to call that person? Um, I like a, an emergency response director or a critical response director, something like that. Uh, depending on the size of your community, you may want to consider a, a volunteer administrator or perhaps even a, a subcommittee to lighten the, the burden on the board. All right. So, Ross, in your opinion, like that, that emergency response director, is there like a specific list of items that he should recommend the uh, the members of the association, the residents, the the homeowners, to to have on hand and ready to go? Absolutely, and and there's a ton of things that we could all think about here. I'll, I'll rattle off a few of them. 
Uh, and there's even more things that we could forget to bring. And that's why we want to prepare this list in advance. So, you know, like a list of medications, first aid kits, cash in case the power is out from this event, battery packs, all charged, cords for your phone, flashlights, extra batteries, a mobile hotspot so you have a little internet access if the towers are working, of course, food and water for a few days, Ziploc bags, I think is a highly important one. And more importantly, while we're advising you to have a plan, you should advise that your residents have one as well. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. Now, we have with us a fourth person today. I'd like to welcome Nicole Mitchell. She is the queen of claims here at JGS. And uh, Nicole, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do. Okay, so I handle the claims at JGS for the habitational side. And I basically handle everything you have claims related. All right. So I'm sure there's never any claims coming your way, is there? Never. Never. Okay. So uh, following up on Ross's comments, do you find anything particularly useful? Do you want to make a comment on, on that list that the um, disaster chief commander officer should have ready? Yes. The entire list is a great is great to have. However, the battery pack, the cash, the Ziploc bags are particularly useful. The Ziploc bags can hold all of your important documents that you don't want to get ruined. And they can also hold the cash and protect your phone. Very true. That's a, that's a good point. Now, on, on your side, that's a very practical step that you remind us of, uh, uh, Nicole, and we segue with that, uh, Ross. Any practical steps, actions that should be taken to be part of the plan? Um, since you have the property management background, you, you may be able to have some different insight point of view. So again, this is one of those very lengthy lists. So I'll rattle off about five of them that tend to get overlooked. Uh, you know, predetermined staging area for your debris, you know, like nobody ever thinks like, hey, where am I going to put all of this stuff? Maybe getting a contract in advance for dumpsters as well. Storage, if you have a location for additional materials or work with your contractors to see if that's something they can support you with. A uh, very important one to me is your census forms or a listing of all the occupants, the number of people in each unit and building. God forbid we're, you know, trying to find people in an event of an emergency. Most importantly here, get a website for all of your communication tools. A lot of management companies offer them, but you could also get them up on your own as well. Now, that, that's a lot of good steps that we can put in place, and I'm sure the, the plans will define more. But um, what can the association do if, for example, hypothetically, uh, the residents are not heeding the, the direction given by the board? Should the association dedicate some funds to, to get ready, to acquire some supplies? What do you think, Steve? Uh, yeah, I, what do you mean? The, the residents and the unit owners always follow the, the direction of management, <laughs> right? <clears throat> no, uh, okay, seriously, the association should be prepared to protect the property and help assist with the safety of the residents to a certain degree. Now, a few dollars of preparation can save a few thousand in repairs. Uh, and every association is different. So the needs here are really wide ranging. Uh, you may also want to consider having funds available for mitigating losses, uh, some emergency operations, keeping people safe during and after a disaster. We, we may not be able to predict what type of disaster may occur, but they all cost money, right? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, Steve, you're so right there. You know, residents following directions by management and the board, you know, that happens all the time. <laughs> not. Uh, but management and the board members definitely know better. They know that they can't get everybody to follow directions, and that's why they need to have these plans prepared, educate their communities, and provide them with all the support they require, especially when a disaster strikes. Well, true. But whether the, the residents are going to follow the instructions or not, you know, the board still has fiduciary responsibility to the association to protect the residents, to take steps to protect that home and also their pockets. Um, Ross, why don't you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, so like I think the, Steve touched on that and he's also right there. You know, we want to be proactive. Things are definitely impossible to predict. We don't get a lot of warning with every disaster out there. And that's why we need to plan accordingly for every individual disaster. We're not talking having one master plan, but we're having like arms from that plan to handle various events. Uh, all your associations are different. They have different risks. They're in different locations. And, you know, based on your geography and what you see there, there's different disasters. Uh, are you near water? Are you in a flood zone? Do you have frequent earthquakes or maybe you're in a high wind zone? Take the time to discuss this disaster plan for each event 
And of course, budget accordingly, because if you spend now, you'll definitely save later. You know, you don't want to avoid throwing out thousands of dollars on these costs. That's a good point. And good points of reflection for the board when they're putting that plan together. Um, now, n we know the board is, is going to give that direction. The residents are not always going to follow it, but we still want to have that, that plan ready. Uh, thanks, thanks for pointing that out. Now, do you have any practical steps with your background that you can point the, uh, the board to put in the plan that should be written down? Definitely. So first and foremost, take some before pictures of your association, know and have it on record what it looked like before the event took place. Assess your security of the association. Maybe consider a system or a security team, depending on what's going on and your size. Communication plans. Who are you going to contact? How are you going to contact them? Not just your residents, but all your service providers as well. And what are you going to do when the power's out? You know, you got to have a plan in place there. Evacuation plans, emergency plans, not just on the computer, but printed out on hand. You know, having the old school hard copy goes a long way here. And every good plan has a backup plan. You need to expect the unexpected. And of course, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen, so there will be some delays. Make sure you have all your critical documents ready to go. Create templates, hard copies again, backed up on the cloud, and this will help streamline your process. Document everything. Over communicate. Involve your insurance broker, your association attorney, and create this plan hand in hand. Uh, while you were talking, uh, Steve, I saw you. It seems like you had an idea of parking up. In uh, yeah. Um, Go ahead. There's, don't forget, your, your restoration company is a great resource for this. Uh, they've seen all kinds of events. Uh, the better companies offer expert guidance for developing a comprehensive disaster plan. So they're, they're, they're a great resource. They'll work with the managers. They work with the boards and the committees. Uh, they'll establish and maintain a, a plan custom tailored to your community. So if you don't have a restoration company on the ready, you should probably find one sooner than later. Good point. And, and uh, Steve. Ross, you, you mentioned something about communication, like different tools for communication. What should be talked about within the board as far as having a communication strategy? Well, again, we're talking before, during and after. So that strategy has to go hand in hand. You know, as you're being informed, you want to provide the news or the direction that you're being given by your management company and, of course, your local authorities. Again, those templates, if you have them created in advance, you'll streamline your communication. You could have like plug and play scripts, your phone blast, your email blast all ready to go for the community when the emergency strike. Have all your contacts on hand, emergency services, police departments, gas company, and so on. Of course, your broker, your attorney, and all your supporting vendors. Uh, if your management company doesn't have that type of software, there's definitely third parties out there that will provide it directly to the association. So you can send out phone calls in one shot to your entire property. What's the best uh, way to communicate uh, the evacuation procedure, Nicole? Okay, so you should have a set plan in place ahead of time and you can advertise it on your website and also hand out paperwork to the, commu to the community residents. Whether it's June to November and it's hurricane season or the snow season, hand out separate paperwork for each season so it's new to each unit owner. Um, also let the residents know what the board plans on doing and not doing for them ahead of time, before and after a disaster, and also publish the locations of emergency shelters and local evacuation procedures. Now that's interesting that you talked about the, ch the shelters because what do I do if I have to go to a shelter with my, my pet alligator and my uh, friendly unicorn? <laughs> well, I know whose unit I'm going to hang out at later today. Can't wait to see the alligator and the unicorn. But you know, all kidding aside, pets shouldn't be left behind. Be aware of those shelters, like Nicole mentioned, you know, make sure everything's pet friendly, of course. And I know this goes without saying, but we see it all too often. People leave pets behind. 27 cats in a birding building, dogs, you name it. It's terrible. Uh, and I know most of you have rules against that many cats, but if you don't, you should definitely talk about adopting new rules during your pre-renewal strategy meeting. I've never heard of an association yet to have rules against my unicorn, so it's good. <laughs> Now, uh, what kind of what kind of service providers such as us, the insurance professional, the restoration companies, or contractors do to assist the board in its endeavor to get ready before the disaster strikes? Uh, Steve, want to take that? 
Um, you say, well, in addition to that, well, really, believe it or not, having a list of, of the residents and their emergency contacts uh, in case you need to gain access to a unit and you, you don't want to break the door down, uh, cause more damage. Yeah. Um, you should you should really have uh, contact for backup management. So if you if you can't get a hold of your your association's manager, uh, you got to get a hold of the, the management company, find out who their backup is. Uh, of course, you know, like you mentioned, the restoration company, engineering company, contractors, uh, lastly, you know, insurance people, uh, and anybody else. Board members, here's a, here's a good one. Board members should have a list of each other's phone numbers next of kin uh, and a little bit a little bit of vital information. Now, this helps out um, having what type of vehicle they have and the tag numbers. So a lot of times when you have these, these uh, events, things aren't the way they used to be so gates may be inoperable you don't want anybody just coming and going who doesn't belong in your association so when the gates are inoperative you want to know who the board members are you want to know who's authorized to be there because security may not be up to snuff during during an emergency good idea so it kind of brings up the idea of having a uh, a playbook but what should be in that playbook i have a little example here um so, but not to get too specific, uh, the contact list all in one place. Uh, there should also be a post claim timeline. I like that. Okay, idea. This is, and Nicole mentioned this, it's what you've agreed will be the order of operations after an event. So it provides responsibilities who does this, who does that, uh, who calls this person. Um, so that the, the post claim timeline provides a basic timeline of how long it should take for certain things to happen. So people have been displaced and they're very emotional. Uh, nothing is really as important as them right now. Make very true. So what's the key takeaway for all those points that were brought up on what to do before? Well, if I could jump in there, I, I mean, to me, the most important thing to take away from this is managing the expectations. We, we can't do everything at once. It's going to take some time to get through this. But if we can give some assurance that things will be done in a timely fashion, well, then there's some comfort and some trust. Uh, we can assuage people's fears. Uh, we can keep people calmer uh, and be more effective. And calm people are usually easier to deal with uh, they're less emotional, there's less name calling. Less tension for sure, and that, that makes everybody's job easier. Now, let's jump into what's happening during the event. So let's say you have a windstorm, some kind of event of that nature. Any recommendation of what to do during the event? Uh, Nicole, we're going to take that first. Use common sense. Don't be a hero. If something happens to you, who's going to help you now? Yeah, stick to your plan. Stay calm, stay cool. Cooler heads always prevail. Stay on top of the situation, very close to it. Put yourself in the resident's shoes if you're not already there yourself. Be compassionate with your every move. And you know, the people really need you here more than they ever did before. Keep yeah. that in mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the communication is a key while things are happening. You know, as events unfold, managers, board members, and certainly unit owners should not be putting themselves in harm's way. Yeah, sometimes you just have to ride that wave. You made that plan, you stick to the plan. During the storm, it's not time to change everything. Now, what can we do after? What should be done, let's say, right after the disaster struck? Uh, Nicole, that's your department. Protect your property from further damage and contact your broker. All right, so is there now any duties towards the carrier themselves? Perform any emergency repairs that prevents further damage from happening. Um, call a plumber, call the remediation company, call the fire department, etc., and take pictures of the damage right after it happens. Yeah, that's a good point because now you, you had taken the pictures before, that's what Ross told us to do, and now you, mm -hmm. had, you have before and after. That's yes. pretty practical. Um, do you need, so you mentioned call your broker. Um, what if you can't get a hold of him? Uh, Ross's phone number is 732, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, you know, and if not me, call Steve or Dave, of course, <laughs> you know, but all, all kidding aside, let's be serious here. You know, all damages, document everything, take pictures, get in the driver's seat and take control of your process. So when we talked about damages, it sounds like the sweet smell of quick repairs. What should be something to keep in mind, even within our plan, when it comes to hiring contractors, like, it sounds like you know prime time for scammers definitely so contractor insurance adjusters uh danger danger will robinson uh this is stranger danger but only for adults right so they watch the news just like the rest of us do and some of these folks are storm or ambulance chasers they'll come speeding into our communities 
and try to get our residents as well as our boards to contract their services on items we may or may not require. Right. So then supply and demand issue strike. We talked about that a couple of sessions back. Uh, the rise for materials. Right. So cost there can't find them. Contractor availability. It all takes place when disasters strike. It's nice. this is kind of like your buyer's beware warning, you know, lean into the vendors that, you know, through like Community Association Institute, for example, that you see all the time. Well, thanks for the advice. And I uh, really like the uh, Lost in Space reference for them. <laughs> uh, Steve, uh, you were actually in New Jersey when uh, Sandy struck. Um, have you had any experience with uh, scammers or anything like this that you can illustrate? Well, uh, wow, I can spend all day on that. Um, I'll, I'll try oh, to give you like 30 seconds. <laughs> all right, 30 seconds. All right, car chat. So, um, well, I was boots on the ground just hours after the storm passed, uh, and I never seen anything like it, and I hope I never do again. But I learned a lot about what you need following something like that. Uh, all of our computers were destroyed, hard files were destroyed, we had no water, no electricity, no plumbing, no trucks, no equipment, and even some of our offsite backup failed. Now, what I learned was uh, what we needed most was a plan, uh, a plan that we didn't have. Um, I I've survived dozens of hurricanes living on the coast and I didn't give this one much of a thought and boy, I was wrong. So just having a plan in place would have made recovery so much easier uh, and probably saved a lot of money and a lot of heartache following that disaster. I mean, we, we actually ended up, uh, we exhausted the limits of our commercial policies and eventually lost a, a boat dealership. And, and now they're building homes on that property. I, I certainly learned a, a lot about insurance in a very, very short time. Yeah, I imagine so. But now, uh, as the association put that plan together, they have a post-storm, post-disaster protocol strategy, if you will. Uh, what is one thing that you absolutely would recommend with your experience that they should include in it? Uh, all right. So part of our, part of our response handbook here um, should be an, a, a contact event log. All right, managers, uh, listen up. This is some CYA for you guys. This is going to make your life a lot easier. So a contact event log, uh, it, it has times, dates, and who you contacted and what was their response. So it's very important. Email is great. Uh, but it can be difficult to follow the trail, especially when you consider the volume of emails that are going to be flying around, uh, all kinds of opinions, and there's keyboard heroes going back and forth. So uh, just a quick example, Mr. and Mrs. Smith want to know when the roof will be repaired and the tarps are going to be removed because Mr. and Mrs. Jones from Piney Court had theirs done last week and theirs wasn't nearly as bad as the Smith's and your handy uh, contact event log will have the last time you spoke to the roofer. Uh, when they plan to get to the Smith's unit. And so you can spell that out, you can manage those expectations and, and you can actually calm the people down instead of uh, getting it out of both ears. Very, yeah, very I like good. that idea, Steve. Point. Yeah, the event logs is great. Uh, you know, go a little old school, you know, good old fashioned pen and paper should really do the trick for you there, you know, yeah. avoid the email chains. It sounds like double data entry, but with everything else you're doing, I think it really will help you in the long run. Uh, and another important document for your residents is that post repair or a priority repair and reinstatement checklist. Uh, we've heard it called a few different things along the way, but it's really another communication tool to help your residents know what your priorities are, when you're going to take action, and really what your action plans are after a disaster. Everybody's got a priority and we all have different perception as what the priority should be. Very true. Now, if you don't already have an engineer working with your association, uh, should you hire one at that time or even hire a contractor to do repair? And Nicole, what do you think? Yes, absolutely. Hire a contractor. They can give you estimates. They can even send the estimates to the adjuster handling the file and they can work to come to an agreed value. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe your brother in law can do it, but we want a contractor. <laughs> so how about hiring your own insurance um, insurance adjuster? You no, that's, that's not needed at all. Um, the adjuster at the carrier will also hire, hire a third party adjuster to inspect the damage, write their own estimates. So your own adjuster is not needed. Gotcha. So claim professionals like Nicole, they're going to be the first line of defense of other people that you talk to first and they are your advocate to the carrier. So. That's the point to take away from that. Now, do we have any questions that we want to address? Rachel is uh, saying this, maybe you want to pitch in on it. Uh, Nicole says, have the engineer on standby to determine if there are structural issues. Yes, definitely. 
the engineer will be able to do that. The carriers also also might hire an engineer, but if you have one that already gives an entire synopsis and opinion on what what occurred, they won't need to hire an engineer if you already have one. Gotcha. All right. So you might as well do business with people that you choose to do business with in the first place. Yes. Uh, now, what happens if you don't do any of this? Russell, ben Franklin and Ryan Fleming once said, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Uh, you might end up spending more of your association funds than you really should in order to become whole again. And having a strategy is always better than a last minute scramble. Actually, I heard that Ben Franklin took that phrase from Ryan Fleming. You know, I heard they went to the same high school. <laughs> Believe it. <laughs> oh boy. So Ross, uh, what do you think about this? Uh, is it advisable, uh, advisable to hold a fire drill or practice evacuation for your clubhouse and your multi-use buildings? Definitely. Uh, I say absolutely yes, this is recommended. It should be part of your plan. And you know, earlier we mentioned communicating to your residents, communicate, communicate, communicate. So they should have a plan as well. And practicing fire drills or evacuations could actually be very beneficial to those with small children. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Now, question for you, Steve. That's a good one. All right. Is this wonderful plan, marvelous plan? Yes. Is this going to reduce my insurance premium? Well, all right. So not directly. <clears throat> However, keeping the claims from spiraling out of control will keep the loss history and in turn your loss ratio down. That's an important word, the loss ratio. Uh, that definitely has a direct impact on your premiums. The harder that you ding your loss history, the higher the premiums are going to go. So if you guys have questions about your loss ratio, what that means, uh, feel free to reach out. I'll put my, my email in the chat, uh, but that's, that's how it's going to affect you. All right, I think uh, the, the next one, uh, thank you, Steve. I think the next one is for you, Nicole. And I'm not sure if you should take this sarcastically, if it's a joke or what, but I'm going to read the question. What okay. happens when a tree fall? Okay, <laughs> I get this one a lot. So if a tree falls on covered property, there is coverage to remove the tree and of course fix the covered property. However, if a tree just falls in a forest or if it falls on the ground or the street, there's no coverage to remove to remove the tree because it's not falling on covered property. Now, in the same scenario, if a tree falls on a neighbor's unit or a neighbor's car, there's also no coverage to remove that tree. It's the neighbor's responsibility, either with their homeowner carrier or their auto carrier, to remove that tree and fix their own damage. It's considered an act of nature. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Well, we appreciate everybody's uh, everybody's time. Thanks for joining us today for this fourth installment of Hackworks uh, Power Webinar. Thank you very much for, for joining us and we'll see you next time.